further ado, take it away. All right, very good. Well, thank you for the uh, for the opportunity here to present um, to the society. Um, kind of privileged and excited to be uh, able to share some of the seismic story. Um, seismic is is a tool um, that's used um, predominantly in oil and gas to map features in the subsurface, and and I think it's an under underutilized tool in the mining space, especially this side of the pond. I'm going to show you some examples. Um, most of them actually from Australia. Um, where the uh, the technology is actually fairly or a lot more mature, should we say, than uh, than it is in this part of the world. So, um, I think if planned correctly, the products that Seismic can uh, can deliver um, can be quite highly prized. Um, so, I'd like to show you some examples of that. I can figure out how to click to the next slide. There we go. So. Um, the outline of my um, proposal today, I'll introduce myself. I know you introduced me already, but I'll go through a really quick introduction to myself and high size for those guys who don't know who high size is. I'll introduce the, the company that I'm uh, representing. Um, talk a little bit about some of the advancing technology. That's the real gist of this uh, of this talk. Um, trying to get geological products out from um, from seismic geophysics outputs. Um, so I'll walk through um, focuses on design through acquisition, through processing of the data, through some in, some really pretty unique interpretive products that we're managing to uh, to get out, utilizing some machine learning and um, some fancy stuff, and then some rock property output using some inversion techniques. And then lastly, I'll just talk a little bit about how we deliver all that technology because it's great having technology, but if you can't deliver it to a customer. Then it's um, then it basically just gets shelved. And I think historically, we've seen a lot of seismic projects just sit on someone's desk and not really get utilized appropriately. So, um, so I will talk a little bit about me. Hopefully, not too long. Um, so this is I graduated in 1988 from the University of Leeds um, with actually a geological sciences degree. Um, my son was laughing at my mullet yesterday. Um, I don't think it was a mullet. I think it was kind of a trendy haircut at the time. But anyway, he told me it was a mullet. And uh, uh, graduated in Leeds in the, from the UK. You can probably hear my British accent. And then uh, did a little stint in uh, in Libya, um, working on onshore data there. After that, I actually got a really interesting assignment down in South Africa, where we were shooting a 2D seismic and eventually 3D seismic in the in the Vitz Basin. Um, um, basically looking for VCR contact reefs. And um, it was that was kind of, I didn't realize at the time how unique that was because um, it was only really my second posting overseas, but um, that hard rock, um, those hard rock ideals are still utilized today um, in, in some of the projects that we do in, in Australia. Um, after that, I moved to Houston, did some, did some onshore stuff in uh, onshore Texas and Louisiana. Um, spent some time in Venezuela. I um, didn't really improve my Spanish much, unfortunately, but uh, can tick South America off the box. And then I moved to Canada um, in uh, in um, 1999. Um, set up an office in Calgary. Again, this, most of this is is sort of oil and gas focused, but all onshore, all seismic. It's kind of my areas of expertise. I um, processed a lot of land data. Moved into management roles, project development roles, and sales roles. And now I'm in this uh, BD role. So I'm trying to basically um, show clients and, and customers and anyone really who listened to me about uh, the value of seismic and what it can do in uh, to, to tackle um, basically looking mapping the subsurface. Um, so I've been doing this this role for about uh, 18 months now. Oh, I did spend a little bit of time in Perth, actually, in between there. So I've kind of <laughs> been around the globe. Um, lived in all these places rather than just visited so that was interesting spent these two or three years in each of these places um and you know just a quick summary of who i am um you know i like to get outside like to uh like to wander around in the mountains quite a bit so being based out of calgary now is uh ticks ticks most of the boxes that keep you satisfied um so let's move on from me to high size who's high size we're a, a niche um seismic company we uh we explore with utilizing a hard rock seismic. Um, HQ is Perth, Australia. Um, there's some people over in Europe and myself, this side of the pond. Um, so where have we worked historically? So we've we've uh, acquired about 100 projects worldwide. 
Um, we've actually acquired stuff uh, in Canada, US, South America, um, quite a bit in Africa, um, some in Europe. But the majority of the uh, projects that we've acquired, and let's see, 90% of them have been in Australia. So I'll show you some examples of some of these uh, Australian data sets. I'll show some Goldfield, some Northern Star, some South 32, and some Rex uh, data sets, utilizing those to, to basically highlight some of the technology. Um, um, okay, so maybe just a, a, a list of some of the clients that we uh, we do work for. Definitely not an exhaustive list, but uh, um, so where did high size originate? High size originated. It spawned out of Curtin University in about 2010. Um, there was lots of uh, hard rock seismic um, study and research done, and what they decided to do was spawn out a commercial entity. Um, which is high size out of that uh, university. And uh, for about 10 years or, or so, um, pretty organically grew shooting seismic and, uh, and uh, you know, basically processing it, interpreting it and trying to create value. About two years ago now, so probably about the same time as, uh, as the start, start of COVID, unfortunately, and there was a change of management and a real focus on on the product side of things rather than focus on the acquisition. Um, the real focus on the improving the products, improving the resolution of the seismic that we deliver. Um, from then, improving the insights that you can gain from, um, from the seismic once it's been shot and processed. And then and then sort of more recently, and, and some of these things are really hot off the press, um, looking at things beyond what you can see in seismic. So um, looking at interpretive techniques that's, that see beyond what we can see visually, which is kind of exciting. And some of that stuff's from um, medical imaging field. So I am definitely not a master of all of these topics, but I will do my best to explain them as best I can. And if, if there's any uh, if there's any questions, I'll do my best to answer them, but uh, I may have to, have to um, carry them to, to some of these experts. Anyway, so um, what, is, what is the role of, uh, of what we're trying to do here? Well, we're trying to, effectively reduce the uncertainty of, 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 of knowledge of the subsurface. Um, so seismic is trying to see between and, and below and beyond um, the uh, the drill holes, which are really the ground truth, right? If the, if the drill hole is the ground truth, how do we how do we see what's in between and below, especially? And I'm asked all the time, funny, funny questions, how deep can seismic see? Well, you know, effectively seismic can see as deep as um, you know, the, the amount of energy that you want to put into the ground and the amount of listening time that you've got to, to listen. I mean, some of the lithoprobe um, data from Canada basically sees down, you know, a good 10, 12 kilometers if you're prepared to, uh, to organize things correctly. So with a big enough bang and a long enough listening time, we can definitely see deep. But, you know, most of the time the focus isn't down 10, 12, whatever kilometers. Most of the time the focus is very much the shallow. And uh, what can we mine out of the earth? So talk a little bit about that. Um, so like I say, I'll, I'll walk through some of these things, walk through some of the work we've done with identifying faults, walk through some of the work we've done identifying lithologies, and then some of this uh, this exciting textual attribute analysis that we've been we've been engaged in. Um, so if we if I walk through my presentation. The same way you'd probably walk through a project, you'd, you'd start off with thinking about the design, um, going through some feasibility and some potential modeling. How, if you want to shoot some seismic, if you have some questions to answer, how do you um, how do you go about that? So I'll talk a little bit about what we do on the design side, and then we'll walk through to uh, some of the end products. So just a little bit of seismic 101 for, I mean, I've been doing this so long, <laughs> you sort of... <laughs> Forget that uh, you don't know where people are, but just you know, seismic is is a is a technique that um, basically um, utilizes um, boundaries or acoustic impedance boundaries. Acoustic imp impedance being the, the product of density and velocity. So whenever you've got a change in the earth of density and or velocity, and they're not uh, they're not the inverse of one another, um, then you're going to see a response. If you put um, sound waves in the ground, you're going to and you put your receivers where they um where they should be, you're going to see a response back, which is which is great. Um, and a little uh, simplistic um, 
you know, cartoon here. So I like to keep it simple to begin with. Um, you know, you've got your sound source um, bouncing off the rock layers. They're really, really obviously a fully flat layer cake kind of model here and coming back towards the geophones. But, you know, effectively the, the rocks that we deal with in the mining space, hard rocks, are nothing like this. So they, they have um, dips, they're usually fairly complicated. They're, um, we don't really know much about the acoustic impedance response. Um, they have different types of geometries and all of those questions have to be answered before you've even started thinking about, you know, how much surface access can I get? What's the topography like? Um, any environmental issues and, and then obviously the cost side. So we, we, we go through the process of trying to analyze um, some of those questions. Um, just uh, as a little bit of an aside, um, the types of rocks that we're used to looking at are much faster than uh, generally than um, a lot of other um, types of uh, lithologies in the geological record. So we're, we're very used to, to that. And, and even though they're faster, they're not all the same um, velocity. So in terms of uh, MP wave velocity. So we, um, we, take, we take advantage of some of the, the changes in those attributes. So as the rock type and the density and the velocity changes, you get a effectively a reflection coefficient that will help you um, um, garner some, some, some response from the earth. And, and we, we generally say that if that's plus or minus more than 5%, then um, we should be able to see something coming back. So um, how do you test that? You test that um, hopefully with uh, some sort of sonic tool, some, some sort of wireline. Um, tool down the hole. We'll te test the uh, the VP um, and VS velocities directly from the borehole. It's the best way to do it. Um, if you can't do it that way, then you can actually use uh, one of these little devices that we call a Crazy Ivan, and basically you can actually log um, the velocity from core. So it measures uh, the velocity between the two points. We've got, as a company, we've got about, uh, I think it's about nine or 10 of these devices. Two of them I have this side of the pond right now. Um, so you can get a, a, a broad profile of what the velocity is doing um, underground through that core and build yourself up a, a reasonable model. And then density, you, uh, you can just take measurements from the core. Um, and then you have yourself a, an estimate of acoustic impedance. Um, so you know, what types of uh, boundaries um, do we do effectively affect um, acoustic impedance changes? And, you know, you've got any types of interfaces, lithological interfaces, alteration zones, faults and shears usually have good or good response, bedding planes and unconformity. So that's kind of a broad range of um, what we do. Um, the, the thing about reflection, um, seismic is you've really got to think about what is it's a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario where you've almost got to have a broad model in your mind of what's going on so that you can actually then um, map a program or set a program out of the surface to be able to record um, what's what's going to be returning um, and you can see just again a simplistic model of if you have a, a dipping event and this isn't really a steeply dipping event then you get a lot of offset on your on your receiver side um, so you need to really think about and plan ahead because I think if you don't plan ahead, then you're not going to be placing your receivers in the right place to collect the returning energy. Um, again, a simplistic, and I talked about chicken and egg, flat laying, flat laying, laying um, you know, oil and gas style um, uh, rocks tend to be fairly simplistic and you can, you can set up a survey actually fairly easily. Um, once you get more complex geology and that complexity is in three dimensions, you've really got to, you've got to do some work. And, we can, and the way we do that work is through various forward modeling kind of processes, um, looking at simple synthetic models, convolution, convolutional models, and doing some wave equation modeling if, if appropriate. And then uh, some illumination studies where you're basically firing rays into the earth at, you know, what you think um our um our targets dips and then and basically seeing where they return to the, the earth so once you once you've done all that you can put together a, a reasonable design um so once you've you've got yourself a seismic design you then have to go and um then have to go and shoot the survey so how do you go about doing that and uh, and how do you go about doing that in canada um so 
here's a here's a typical seismic survey we call this an orthogonal type design where the receivers run in in one direction along lines and the uh, sources run um, orthogonal to them um, generally uh, line spacing are from a from a mining perspective for fairly shallow targets is you know plus or minus about 100 meter line spacing and then you might have your receivers 12 and a half meter spacing and um, sources depending on the type of source you're using um, double that so this is how you would place you've got a, a carpet or blanket if you will over your um <clears throat> over your surface where you've got good access and the challenge comes where you don't have that access how you create that access and how you basically look at different source types to uh to try and um find your way around and get and get that um source in the ground and then get the receivers in the right place to be able to uh, collect the information coming back um so let's talk about this there's two sides to the seismic experiment there's the source side and the receiver side um I'll talk about the receiver side because actually that's a lot easier today than it ever was. And if you look at the pictures on the on the left hand side of my um, plot here, you can see some old cabled systems where you basically had to bring, you know, a huge truck with trailers full of all these basically wires which have uh, the the cabled um, geophone systems. Um, that eventually went to what they used to call nodal systems, which is a geophone. Um, with a battery power and some external um, memory storage. Um, it still had some cables involved and it's still rather clunky. Today, modern geophones, and we're talking about the last three or four years, um, are very similar to, or well, actually they are, the uh, what you see there on your on the right hand side. Um, that's a stride um, geophone, quantum geophone is down there on the, in the bottom right. Modern geophones are light, they're cheap, the cableless, they have their own power source, they have their own storage, and they have their own GPS. The data is easy to get off them, and they're generally pretty broadband. And you can see trays of receivers sitting there. So they're really relatively easy to deploy. You can carry trays around and basically plunk them in the earth and, uh, and effectively get a good response, as good as you would um, on your cable systems. Um, kind of a little bit like, um, Think about cell phone technology it's all getting lighter it's all getting uh, better and in this case unlike cell phones it's actually getting cheaper as well so uh so the the receiver side is is actually um is actually fairly easy to uh to, to plan for this the source side a little bit more tricky especially in this part of the world um now our, our preferred um seismic sources is, is usually vibra size it's cheap it's effective it comes in different sizes I um, mean, you can see a couple of Vibrosize, actually three of them, Vibrosize trucks basically uh, in the middle of Quebec City there, um, you know, basically shaking down the road, which is really cool. So as long as you can get access, Vibrosize is definitely our preferred um, source type. Um, uh, the secondary source type that we, we use quite a bit is a small drill dynamite. So basically a shallow hole, we drill a hole about three meters and use about a quarter kg into that hole. Um, you can get some pretty cool shaped charges these days which effectively keep the energy um, from returning to the surface and basically sp spraying a bunch of rocks on top of you um, so losing all the energy up so it's th those are our two um, preferred source types however and there's a couple of videos here um, both of those different source types and hopefully you can see these at work this is a this is a rather large uh, i think it's sixty four thousand pound um, single vibe sweeping in a in a Canadian field. Um, you'll see the pad go down and you'll see it shake. So if you've never seen seismic before, this just gives you an idea of, of how vibra size works. Um, and on the right the right hand side there, there's a little a little shock going off, which as you can see just moves that mat. All right, so enough of that, uh, those little movies. Um, so how do you access, you know, in, in, in Western Canada, isn't just a you know, flat desert gravel plain. Um, most Canada's got trees in. So how do you how do you go about getting these um, these source types, these vibra size trucks and these these small drill rigs down um, down um, through your survey? Well, we um, we utilize uh, a mulching technique um, 
that is relatively low impact and does create lines. We construct lines, um, but those lines are constructed um, with the, because they're constructed with these mulches. Um, it really does promote um, tree growth and actually avoids most uh, most timber damage. And you don't have to keep the line straight. So you've got you've got no particular line of sight down this uh, seismic line. It'll definitely uh, broadly move in between the larger trees um, in a certain direction. And the reason we do um, this type of what we call low impact um, source is because when you uh, when you mulch a seismic line, unlike um, they used to uh, say 30, 40 um, years ago, um, it really does promote the regrowth. And I've actually flown over a couple of seismic surveys that we shot in BC um, two or three years ago, and you wouldn't even know they were there because of the fast regrowth because of that mulching. So I know I know a lot of the country is scarred by old seismic lines, but today I don't think we do we do anything like that, and uh, and a lot of that um, regrowth happens particularly quickly. If you can't get one of those vibrosized trucks or those draw rigs, um, there are some other options too. Um, there are um, Betsy guns or buffalo guns. There's a couple of examples here that you'll see, um, which effectively let off a, a, a blank cartridge. Um, there's uh, you can actually drill a really shallow hole and put a, a, a tiny um, charge down there. Um, anything large will actually you can actually go to you know, back to school <laughs> hammer and plate. That won't get you uh, that won't get you very deep, but it'll get you a source. Or you can go to um, a more of a weight drop type system. So it gives you a, a flavor of you know some of the different things that. Uh, Different source types that we can that we can employ, and I think a key takeaway from this is, if you and, and we we see this quite a bit, you can actually mix and match all these sources to the environment. So if you have roads, you use you use vibrosize down the roads. If you have tracks that vibrosize tracks don't fit down, you can actually but you can get a drill a skinny drill rig down track to drill rig. You can use that. And in those areas and you can't get either of those, you can actually go to some of these other type sources. So a lot of this uh, sits in the design phase and, and what's what's accessible and what's not. Um, so we've designed a survey, we've acquired the survey. Now we want to process the survey. So um, and we've, we've done a lot of this in, in, in high size. So what's the developments? Where's the technology going in terms of processing? Um, so I, I did uh, I did mention previously that um, depth imaging was uh, was a key to um, to to the way we go about our business and processing and depth imaging is is really very appropriate for um, for hard rock um, domain where you've got um, hard and fast rocks in very complex um, systems. So depth imaging uh, helps with multipathing, ray bending, that velocity variation that we, we tend to see really helps with that. So I'll show you a couple of examples of, uh, of that. Um, this is um, a Northern Star um, 3D shot in Western Australia in, the, in Karari. And um, you can just see an example of the old processing, which was time processing versus what we managed to to pull out using depth imaging and you can see that um the just coming up to the i'll just point with my uh into there up to the surface you've got these mon monzonite shears zones which are basically the target and how they couple with and what you what you see on the surface is a plan view of um refraction tomography velocity field um and uh how the two really do now couple whereas they were completely decoupled with some horizontal nasty looking kind of noise or something going on but basically the um the depth imaging processing has really improved to the signal right up to surface so i think one of the um, complaints about seismic previously was that you couldn't see in really into the very shallow whereas now we are uh, with with the depth, depth imaging approach we we very much can um but another example of uh um, before and after depth imaging here this is a time slice so a plan view looking down on a 3D um, from uh, from Northern Queensland, um, Cannington. I can't remember the customer here, but uh, I think it was South 30. Oh, South 32. There we go. Um, you can see just the resolution that you're managing to get the the uh, um, the complexities in the seismic. You you wouldn't have been able to uh, 
really make a, a reasonable interpretation previously, whereas utilizing the new depth imaging technology, you now can, and uh, and you really are getting a, a really good feel of, of, of what's going on in this complex environment. Um, this is from the same survey, just looking at um, different visuals of, of really the same the same section in in different color scales and in and different attribute space. Um, so we designed a survey, we've acquired the survey, it's gone through processing, you've got a depth imaged um, product out. Um, oh, I need to mention this as well. This is a, a byproduct of that depth imaging workflow, um, which is actually kind of nice to get. And it's a, it's a detailed model of the very near surface. Um, and we call it top rock. So basically, it's uh, as a model of the uh, of the near surface to uh, what we call fresh rock. Um, so you can get really, really sort of high resolution. Um, and this is this is velocity um, uh, detail in the, in the near surface. And again, this is just a byproduct of that uh, that workflow. Again, this is looking at a time slice down through a section on a on a on a three D. Um, so now we get into the crux of where things. I mean, I know that the um, the acquisition side has changed, especially on the receiver side, but uh, the crux of where a lot of the work for the last um, the last little bit has gone, and that's in the interpretation side um, with automated fault modeling and and geobody modeling. So I'll walk you through some examples of those. We'll start off with what we call seismics, and it's uh, and it's geobody modeling. So effectively, what it's what it's doing is it's um, it's it's building on some technology that uh, was established in the in the medical imaging field and and it's you know seismic goes back and forward between med medical imaging advancing and and you know earth imaging advancing and there's there's lots of um lots of coexisting um technology that, that swings between both sets um but uh, effectively it's it's a way of really looking at, at textures um within the seismic domain that have, really sort of hidden from the from the human eye and I'll give you some examples of that um so here's a here's a simplistic pictorial of uh computing um statistical textures from uh, on attributes from this one particular image and then once you uh <clears throat> once you have all of those um attributes in those volumes you can then start to segment them and start to sort of combine them and look at what they really mean and in this case it's it kind of gives you a simplistic picture of of that um, if i if i go to the next slide this is this is um kind of interesting um so uh i, I noticed when i put the presentation together and i embedded it in the, the left hand side there Within this image, with what you see with your eye um, as you look from wherever you're sitting, um, there is actually data, and that's the data that's embedded in that image. Okay, so that you and on the, the little one on the left hand side there, I, I noticed that as the further away you got from the image, the actually you could actually see it in there. But as you as you look, your eye doesn't pick that data out. Um, same with this one. Um, this kind of looks like a really noisy seismic section. <laughs> I've seen data that looks this bad before. And um, but you know, within that data, there's there's something that you don't see with the naked eye. So we're actually utilizing um, that that those attributes, um, that those artificial intelligence workflows to get out that subtle textures. And here's an example from uh, South Australia where we've taken a, a seismic volume and we've run it through this uh, seismics uh, workflow and uh, hopefully the video doesn't go too slowly and you can actually utilize some of those um, the geologic features really stand out um, and it's nothing that you'd ever pick up um, with a standard um, interpretive approach I'll let this just play through. But what this has done for Rex is it's shown them um, effectively uh, some, some potential below their current um, mining activity. So that's that's one example. I'll actually skip to the, the, the next one. This is a St. Ives, this is a um, uh, Goldfields, I think, example. 
um, from Western Australia. And again, using the same kind of approach, putting those textures out. So you're not looking at the boundaries, the reflections themselves, you're looking at the textures within the seismic. You really start to, to pull out um, the bodies that are inherently there that you'd never see with the naked eye. This is, this is quite exciting stuff. Um, and the nice thing about some of this stuff is as long as you've got well-acquired data, you can go back and you can actually apply some of these processes, this particular geobody process to any seismic data set you've, you've got. And realistically, you know, 90% of the cost of seismic is, is really in the acquisition side. So you've spent all that money on acquisition, let's see what we can squeeze out. And this is something that you can certainly do that with. Um, <clears throat> so we'll move on from geobody modeling to looking at faults. Obviously, faults are, are, are key to understanding mineral, mineralization in the subsurface. Um, and we're using some really machine learning techniques to identify faults. Faults are really difficult to pick in seismic at the best of times, um, especially in, in, our, in our mining world. Um, so um, how does this uh, fault detection process work? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert at deep convolutional neural networks, but what I've been told is that the process is very similar to, to uh, face matching. Um, so basically you input your data, you detect your the face, you extract information about the face in basically different layers, and then you have a library or you do some training to create a library and you match against that. Um, and that's not the, probably the best explanation ever of, uh, of uh, convolutional neural networks, but it's the best you're gonna get from me, unfortunately. Um, so how does this work in the seismic space? Um, where you, you typically create sub volumes from your seismic volume. You have either a, uh, <clears throat> um, a learned database behind the scenes, a, a, a library. Um, they can be either from synthetics and, and, you know, there are oil and gas libraries of faults, or you create your own libraries and we are busy building libraries today of what faults look like in seismic 3Ds. Um, or you can actually do some training as well. So you can actually take a sub volume and train and then it, it effectively the process goes through and um, and, and the output, you'll see some of the outputs from uh, from um, uh, trained networks and untrained networks. So these are those kind of two approaches um, for these uh, supervised machine learning um, approaches. So um, let's uh, flip through to the actual data example. So this is a uh, Western Australia um, gold mine, Jundi. We shot a, um, shot a 3D over it in, uh, I think it's 2016, but I could be wrong. Key to the um, key to the understanding of the the geology is um, the gold is uh, is really um, constrained into um, veins, brittle fault fracture systems, um, and to a lesser extent, um, a, a porphyry system. So understanding those faults um, is really key to understanding what's going on. And uh, so we shot a 3D, uh, it was right, 2016, about 15 square kilometer 3D. You can see the orthogonal nature of the uh, sources and receivers at the surface. Um, and, uh, and you can also see um, a time slice, a, a plan view of, uh, well, actually this is a depth slice, um, 600 meters below ground. So you can see that you've actually underfilled some of that tailings part as well, which is kind of neat. Um, so how do we extract um, knowledge of faults from, from this 3D? Well, um, first off, you run it. Uh, you run the um, process, the AI fault detection, through a, a pre-trained fault library, and from that you can um, you get this uh, this this um, this output where the um, the blues and as it gets to darker blue, the, there's a probability of uh, of those um, uh, truncations in the seismic being faults. Um, so this is this is the way the process works. Um, you then um, take that down to a single um, single voxel. Um, and then you can actually develop a process by which you can actually compute the azimuths of, of those faults. And then you can actually display <clears throat> and color code the azimuths and you can actually extract um, wireframes from from those uh, those picks, 
And um, so rather than the 3D volume, you can now start to output wireframes and uh, probabilities of those wireframes as well. So you can really play around with this whole um, fault network system. Um, and here's a here's an example of where you've effectively um, uh, color coded all of those different azimuths in a in an let's say an automated approach just just show everything that that um, the algorithmic side has, has picked and it, and it gives you an idea of you know which areas are more heavily faulted than others to, to get something like this out from a seismic interpretation would take a, a very 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 long time so and these these processes are actually relatively well relatively quick um, is a little movie of uh, of the same uh, same data set. You see the mine workings there on the left hand side, and you can see with what we're doing is we're scrolling up through various time slices um, through the through the three D seismic volume and looking at uh, looking at those faults and then looking at how they correlate with them um, with gold assay results from from the mine. I think those those uh, those big red um, balls there, snooker balls, are, uh, are, the, the, are, the, are the some of the big prizes. Um, so we've done this work as well as in uh, as Australia. We've done some of this work in <clears throat> West Africa. We shot a 3D for Perseus in, in the uh, Côte d'Ivoire, um, and some of the results there they really highlighted, um, you know, what's going on and and how those uh, those um, great resources really do um, can be seen at depth. Um, the same as Hillside. We saw that uh, example of that uh, geobody at Hillside, but you know, effectively, these same processes can be applied to the same 3D volumes. And um, you can see a, a nice correlation between some of those copper shells and, uh, and some of the truncations of the of those, uh, those seismic fault features. Okay, so last but not least, I'm going to move on to, uh, to rock properties. So we've got two automated interpretations under our belt. Um, the rock property mapping is a is a method by which we're actually combining um, seismic and, and drilling information, so we can go beyond. I mean, I know the geobody um, textual analysis was looking at um, was looking at uh, uh, bodies, but this is really looking at um, beyond the reflective boundaries and and getting some probability outputs of, of different lithologies, which is is something that's is kind of interesting. Um, so you need a 3D to make this process work, and it uses a, a seismic inversion technique, um, and it uh, and it really it it highlights um, and or delivers um, products that um, geologists and engineers can really understand, and that's uh, that's obviously key because all well, those geologists and engineers hold purse strings to a. Uh, and then can you, if they're going to start utilizing 3D volumes, then they're not going to really look at wiggles. They're going to look at lithology. So um, <clears throat> how does the inv seismic inversion process work? Well, obviously, seismic experiment is um, you know passing a wavelet through a geologic model to produce a trace. All we're doing is flipping that on its head and uh, coming out with a, a p impedance model from a, from a seismic trace. And the reason the way you do that is um, is uh, is is similar to a geostatistical simulation, um, but it has an exception that uh, our models have to honor and include um, the seismic data. So lots of input into the process, the the data being the the seismic data and the drill holes and some of the assumptions being um, all those things you see there on the left hand side. Um, lots of uh, renderings of plausible geology output from this process. Um, this this inversion process, but from those from those multiple outputs, you can actually then um, produce uh, probability um, volumes. So let's have a look at an example of this. Going back to the St. Ives um, um, 3D um, that you've seen before in some of my uh, schematics, but uh, um, the uh, 54 square kilometers was actually quite a large 3D for 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 the, for the mining world. Um, so um, was this shot? I can't remember when the when it was shot. But uh, one of the keys before you start looking at a geostatistical inversion is to look at your logs, and to really um, break down your logs into um, large groups, simplistic groups of lithology, and um, from that you can start to start to see if there's any correlation. We wouldn't be able to see any correlation 
in this space, but when you start to produce histograms of the data itself, you start to see, okay, so we actually got some separation now between, you know, um, the background, the mafic and the, the ultra mafic um, styles of uh, styles of ethology. So once we know this from the logs, we can actually move forward to the next step, which is basically going through that inversion process. If there's no separation in the log space, you're wasting your time. You're not going to get anything valuable out. But if, if you look at your logs and you, you do this process and you can see that separation, then you can move forward and you can actually get lithology volumes out. You can, um, one of the outputs is a P impedance volume. Um, and all of this honors um, that drill hole control. Um, and then you can actually get probabilities of those different lithologies out as well, which is pretty cool. Um, in this particular example, um, it really did change the, the interpretation. Um, and you can see the original interpretation and that shear, that shear zone, um, it's called the Kapai slate, I think it is. Um, and, uh, and you can see the, the additional information that that PMP model is, is, is showing us. Um, yeah, Kapai slate, that's right. Um, and you can see effectively in here, which was the, the, the zone of interest, a lot, a lot more detail and uh, effectively um, new targets. So we have all these cool outputs now. We have geobody modeling, we have faults, volumes, we have um, geostatistical inversion and, you know, lots going on. But one of the the key learnings um, over the last couple of years is how we actually deliver these things to customers. And uh, so we've got a cloud-based platform that allows us to, to sh uh, share knowledge of the things that we're producing, give accessibility to, the, to, our, to our clients so they have an insight of what's going on and be able to support beyond just the deliverables. So um, um, yeah, like I say, cloud-based platform, it basically walks clients through each of the steps that I've really walked you through today in this presentation from the design side, the acquisition side, processing and terp, and allows a sharing platform to, uh, to go back and forward. Um, you can see a, a simplistic uh, approach here, you know, planning, which is the design side, acquisition, data processing and terp, what stage is those at, and then a description of all those products and, and, and the deliverables. And then <clears throat> this is kind of within within the um, the cloud-based platform itself, um, just the sharing files back and forward and keeping keeping up to date with with where the project is, rather than email, Dropbox, just one place to help our clients learn the value of what you can extract from from the seismic volumes. And really, this is only the start. I mean, these three three key interpretive projects that I've shown you today. Are only the start of what we've we're we're starting to think about delivering, and and there's lots of research. So, kind of watch this space; it's moving fast, and um, and I think seismic is going to be um, key to the future for um for 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 miners moving forward. So, without that, it took a little bit longer, and I apologise for that. Then, um, but uh, any questions? Thank you, Andy. It was great. Okay. Well, glad to virtually and in person. <laughs> Uh, so we had a few questions uh, rolling hey. in. Yeah, we'll go in there. We'll go in order. Uh, Jerry, yeah. you were the first one you would like to, to ask. Jerry, are you still, uh, are you still here? Yes, hi. Good presentation. Uh, no, just your statement about the resolution, uh, the excellent resolution of seismic. Uh, just useful to remember that for sh very shallow applications, GPR is even better. Oh yes, yeah. Well, GPR is effectively using similar technology, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, but I just while I'm online, uh, no, I'd say a good presentation. I think your uh, sort of explanations and interpretations would be aided by showing some more aspects of the geology of some of your key examples. Uh, you know, it's a little hard to understand what the seismic features actually relate to in terms of uh, you know ore controls and uh, Structural features that the geologist may have, uh, you know, originally deciphered or uh, mapped. Okay. Uh, no. Thanks. Appreciate that for the feedback. Thank you, Jerry. 
Yep. Uh, so in line with uh, Amir, uh, would you like to ask your question or I can ask, uh, ask for you? Are, you? are you online, Amir? Uh, Amir would like to, uh, to inquire about the, uh, uh, if you're in the swampy environment, how you guys uh, deal with this? Can you still acquire, if, uh, like it's in Northern Quebec, he's giving the example, if it's a really soft ground, what are the strategies or can you do anything with it? Go in the winter. Yeah, just doing the rent All right, yeah. that's yeah. all the problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, I was thinking the same thing. Um, what about all the swamps and the lakes that are all over the place? But I assume that you, you just do it in the winter like we do uh, for other techniques. Uh, how much of your work is done in the winter in Canada? More uh, than so yeah, I mean, most of the projects we've done thus far have been uh, winter projects. It really depends on the terrain. I mean, you, you you adapt your processes to the terrain. I mean, if you've got fairly high dry terrain, then you 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 basically go in the summer, right? But the as you get more um, damper, shall we say, you know, then you'd have to flip it to the winter. Um, yeah. Can you explain uh, some of this, the details of mulching? You know, I know what it is in my garden, but uh, I'm a little curious of uh, how you carry that out in the field. I'm not, I, I'm really fascinated by that. So effectively, that is just it's almost like a big combine harvester, right? It just effectively eats um, eats everything in front of it and drops it behind. So you leave this really highly organic mulch um effectively behind you you don't take any of that material away you actually just leave it and it's a standard approach in the in for oil and gas exploration for creating lines they um if it, you know if, if you're building a if you're building a, a a power line you don't want the stuff to get come back but if you're building seismic lines you want that stuff to grow back as quickly as you possibly can right um so you're not leaving any footprint so these these are standard machines they come in various widths um and but they're uh, all uh, they're all wheeled vehicles you know fairly fairly big wheeled vehicles correct uh yeah though though most of them are tracked i think um so oh, yeah. yeah so they're tracked but they're um yeah and they they effectively a weave. small version of it that would just do something like a meter wide well, that one I showed you in that picture was 175. I think they come skinnier than that, yes. Mm. I mean, gem generally that 175 can get, you can get a, um, and, and if you need wider than that, you can just do two passes right down a line. But um, I can certainly point you toward, towards some guys who can uh, can show you what's what's available. But yeah, that one's- You need to look at this for, uh, for other EM and IP yeah. resistivity surveys. Yeah. Um, my other questions were, um, I assume all your examples are 3D data, right? Yes. Do you guys ever do any 2D acquisition anymore? Yeah, we shot 2D at uh, Red Lake for pure gold. And, uh, and often we'll shoot 2D prior to shooting 3D to give us some um, idea of, um, we can do some line limiting type tests. And uh, so yeah, we shoot 2D as well. I How mean, much of your I, business would be 2D versus 3D? Um, a lot less now than it used to be. I mean, a lot of clients now jump jump right into to the 3D world. Um, I've always been interested in this uh, since the uh, 2017 expiration, 2017, I gave a, a review paper about uh, IP resistivity and it, and it showed that we, we in IP resistivity are like uh, 10 years behind uh, our, our seismic colleagues and in, in converting from 2D to 3D. So I'm just wondering how much longer we'll be doing 2D IP resistivity surveys. Probably for a while yet. I mean, but often often the 2D is really a precursor to 3D. So you'll shoot 2D if if you have a client who you know is a little bit nervous, should we say, about the seismic method. That and, seems to be the way it's going. Yeah. I just noticed on that uh, last bit of the. Uh, properties why is ultramafic a lower acoustic impedance than mafic rocks i would have thought that ultramafic acoustic impedance is higher it's certainly higher density so it must be a lot lower velocity uh i'd have to go back to that table and look <laughs> how do i do that let's have a look get back to 
make sure it's labeled correctly for starters, right? That's what uh, I was wondering. I think it might not be labeled correctly. Uh, and I didn't produce this this plot, so uh, but yeah, I mean, effectively, according to this, yeah, the matrix is uh, unless that's an inverted scale, and I can't read the scale on the bottom. I think that's increasing. It should be increasing from two something. Um, I'll follow up with that. I'll um, I'll ask that question and get back to you. Okay, thanks. Great talk. Very Thank interesting. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else online? We have time for uh, probably one one or two more questions. Okay, very well. Thank you, Andy, again very much for, uh, right. for the time. Very exciting presentation, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll post it uh, on YouTube so that our colleagues around the world can can watch it later. I'm sure it will get a, a lot of views. It's really good. Thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, well, appreciate your time. Thank you.